Hi everyone, it's Steve, and today I want to demonstrate a technique for desoldering and removing dip package chips or integrated circuits like these ones from a circuit board like this one. This is a Commodore 16 circuit board, which I'm trying to resuscitate, and I'm not going to talk too much about the computer, but I want to note that I've already removed these chips from this side of the board, but I'll demonstrate my technique on this last remaining guy up here, which is a 555 timer circuit. Now before I get started, I want to state that Adrian Black has published a fantastic video on this very topic, and I highly recommend you follow his technique if you have the same tools that he uses available to you. In summary, Adrian uses an electric solder pump to simultaneously melt and draw solder away from an IC pin. For those tricky pins that are heat sinked by a large trace, Adrian utilizes a hot air station to melt the solder while gently removing the chip. My problem, and the motivation for making this video, is that I don't have any of the tools that Adrian used. But I was able to remove these chips with all of the following tools. In lieu of an electric solder pump, I have the crappy 30 watt soldering iron that everybody started with, and this very impressive solder sucker. This is one of those high-end manual ones that you can find on the internet, and I think several clones of this exist, so just look for the blue one if you want to buy this. but. It's about 12 inches or 30 centimeters in length, and it provides quite a bit of suction. Oh, it looks like it's already primed. I have some new solder to prime the joints, and I have some flux and some solder wick to help remove solder from really tricky joints. I didn't use the wick too much as I found that it wasn't suitable for getting at really tiny joints, but this kind of helps when you make a mess and you need to clean things up. And speaking of cleaning things up, I use isopropyl alcohol to clean up any flux which is staining the board. In lieu of a hot air station, I use this heat gun, which I've modified with a custom nozzle on the end, which I've manufactured out of a aluminum can, and this helps me focus the air on smaller spaces as opposed to using the standard one and a half inch diameter uh, nozzle on the heat gun. Uh, this here is just a typical closed clamp that will secure the aluminum can to the heat gun. There are some problems with using a heat gun which I will explain in detail later on in the video. Finally, it always helps to have one of these things lying around. This is a headband with a magnifying lens on it. Uh, there's, I think there's a brand called OptoVisor, but you can get this from pretty much any hardware store. It's just a magnifying glass made out of plastic with digital lenses that help adjust the focus and magnification to certain levels. This is really helpful when working on circuit boards like this because you're often squinting and finding tiny little places that you have to apply a soldering iron to. And of course, this will make them look bigger for your eyes. And the last thing I use to help work on a circuit board like this is a vise that I have clamped to my desk. It's not in shot right now, but I'll demonstrate it once we start working on this chip. And basically what that allows me to do is to take my circuit board and swivel it around like so and simultaneously work on it from both sides or rotate it in other directions. All right, with that said, let's get right to work on removing this 8-pin chip. Here's the location of the chip that we're going to remove from the circuit board. And the first thing we'll do is apply fresh solder to each of these eight pins. That will help the solder on the joint flow much more nicely, so it'll be easier to remove it from the board. Here's how I'm using my vise to grip this circuit board and use it in a hands-free manner. First I had to find a place to safely grip the circuit board and I found that the board's ground plane along the edge works very well for this task. There are no components on either side of the plane that can interfere with the gripping mechanism. Now if I have to rotate the board and work on it upside down or in another orientation, then the next best spot to grip the board is the RF modulator. It's a fairly reinforced component and again there are no components installed on its opposite side. So my vise mounts to the table in the following manner. There is an adjustable bolt at the bottom that puts pressure on one side of the table, allowing the vise to grip it from both sides. 
Then this bolt here adjusts the play in this ball joint, preventing it from slipping around. I have it set up in a fairly loose fashion right now so I can demonstrate its motion. This is very handy as I can swing it around in all sorts of directions, forwards, backwards. This lets me work on things from both sides simultaneously and I can orient it in a way that's best suited for the task at hand. The technique that I found very helpful for removing these ICs with these tools is to apply heat to a pin from one side of the board, then pay attention to the other side of the board and watch for the solder to melt. When the solder melts, it's just a matter of sticking the solder pump on and then pulling it away. The reason I do this is twofold. First, if I apply heat to the solder side of the board and focus my efforts here, then I often notice that the solder will flow through to the component side of the board along the IC pin. And I just don't get a good feel of when it's the right time to pump the solder away. I might not get it all on the first shot, so it's a matter of convenience in that sense. The second reason is that I've often seen others apply heat to a joint and stick their solder pump on top like so, making physical contact between the tips of the solder pump and the soldering iron. Now I know these things are supposed to be rated to withstand a lot of heat, but the nozzles aren't indestructible and I want to avoid putting extra wear on them if possible. To be fair, the only time I've noticed where the opposite sides technique doesn't work is when you have a pin that's connected to a very large trace, such as a ground plane or even a power trace. In cases like that, the large trace will draw heat away, acting like a heat sink, and you won't see the solder start to melt on the other side of the board. It just won't happen when using a crappy soldering iron like this one. In that situation, it's practically inevitable that you'll have to bring these two tips close to one another, as you'll need to get them really close to get the extra suction to remove all the solder from the heat sink trace. Now for this chip, there are two pins on such a trace, so I'll have the opportunity to demonstrate both techniques. Okay, so I got the board set up and I'm ready to start unsoldering the pins. I'm going to attempt to film this from both sides simultaneously, so we're going to attempt to remove these eight uh, well, we'll remove the solder from these eight pins over here. This is the 555 timer chip as seen from the back. And on the other side, the 555 timer chip is right here. So I'm going to start applying some heat to these four pins. And when I watch on the other side, I'm going to see the solder melt. And then I'm going to take my solder pump and remove the solder. Okay, so I've noticed that the first pin is a power pin or a ground pin, one of the two. And so I'm not getting enough heat transferred to the other side. So I'm going to start from the center pin and I'm going to watch the other side for a reflow. Here we go. Oh, I didn't prime my gun. Good. All right, let's go move along. So far, so good. On the fourth pin. Okay, so I think I'm going to attempt to remove the solder from the same side of the board as I'm going to suck it from on this pin since it's attached to a large plane. Uh, I might get lucky and get it all in one shot. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to have to use the heat gun to get rid of the remaining solder. So let's give this a try. All right, that works surprisingly well. There might still be a little on the other side. It looks like that might be the case. Uh, we'll investigate that further later. I've looked on the other side and it looks like I won't be able to get my soldering iron under here without me you know, standing on my head and looking to see what's happening. So I'm going to take the time now to rotate this board and put these four pins in a more favorable position. And we'll be right back in a moment. Okay, I've got the board flipped around on my vise. So the next thing I want to do is I want to start removing these pins here. I've noticed this pin is also on a power or ground plane. 
And I also noticed that for this pin down here, which was the last one we removed, that there is a bit of solder that had wicked through on the other side. So it's collecting on the pin side over here. I might try to reheat that and um, get it through from this side once again with the solder pump. Um, and that will avoid me having to use the heat gun. All right, we're going to work right to left and let's see if we can get these three pins fairly quickly. Heat. I have to use my non-dominant hands. So it's going to be a little shaky. There we go. Oops, slipped. And the last pin. more or less worked okay let's try and do some cleanup on this bottom pin over here uh, it's not going through one more shot Hmm, I got some of it, but we'll see if that made any difference. Now, one good way to check to see if you're getting the solder is to put a light source somewhere near uh, the, the board, either from this end or from, from this end. And if you see the light going through the holes, then you've got pretty much most of the solder out. And I can tell just by looking at these pins that I am seeing some light bleed through from this side over here. Now, um, whether that's enough to wiggle the chip out, I don't know. So let's give that a shot. That's pretty sturdy in there. So there might still be some solder holding everything together. Another thing you can do to check to make sure you got all the solder out of these holes is to get a small screwdriver and try to move the leg of the chip you're working on and seeing if it's securely fixed to the hole. So I can tell by the amount of motion whether there's any solder holding it back. And I'll try to do this so that my fingers don't block the camera, but I can try to move this one. That one's pretty loose. So that one's good to go. This one's loose. This one's loose. This one's loose. So those four at the top, they're pretty liberated. I think there's one on the bottom down here, probably this one that's not in good shape. Let's give it a go. Yeah, that one's stuck. Uh, let's see these guys. I'm gonna have to come from the top. That one's in good shape. That one's in good shape. And that one's stuck as well. I seem to have liberated that one uh, somewhat forcefully. Never a good idea. All right, let's try to see if the chip will come out now. Okay, that came out from the top. And let's try the bottom. Very gently. No, it's not moving. Okay, let's get the heat gun out.
So the problem with using this heat gun, as I alluded to earlier, is that there's no temperature control on it. And if you look up the specs at what temperature solder melts at, it's somewhere around 180 or 190 degrees Celsius, uh, depending on the type of solder that you use. And this heat gun will put out a constant temperature in one of two different settings. The lowest setting is something on the order of 500 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, I think, close to 280, 290 degrees Celsius. And therein lies the problem. You're putting way more heat on the board than is necessary. So components like capacitors, especially electrolytic capacitors and transistors, which are somewhere else on this board, are likely going to be affected if you put the heat on for a long amount of time. So you really have to be quick and precise and careful and weigh the risk of doing something like this uh, with the availability of the components that you're trying to remove. In this case, electrolytic capacitors, they're available everywhere. 555 timer chip is pretty much universal. So I'm not too concerned by applying heat to remove this component right here. Um, if I were working on another part of the board, say a MOS specific chip that's no longer in production, uh, I would probably not do this technique, uh, especially if I'm working on the TED chip on the Commodore 16, since that thing is effectively worth its weight in gold. So what I'll do is I'll apply heat to the four pins that are giving me problems on this side of the board. While doing that, I'll try to lever this chip out and hopefully it will just pop right out. If you're not careful and delicate while trying to lever these chips out, you do risk the chance of ripping traces and vias like these little holes here and these ones over here. They might get torn right off the circuit board, in which case um, you're in for some pretty meticulous repair work. So try to be careful when working on this and of course use your own judgment uh, depending on your ability and how much you're willing to risk. And there it goes. I'll pick it up off the floor now. All right, I'm doing a visual inspection of the board to make sure I haven't damaged everything. And it looks like everything is intact. All this mess over here is uh, some solder spray and some flux that could easily be cleaned off the board with some isopropyl alcohol. So I'm looking at this and this looks pretty good. No visible damage there. Let's take a look at the other side. Yeah, a little bit of solder stuck in that hole, but otherwise okay, and no damage on this side too, so fairly successful. And that's a quick summary of the poor man's technique for removing dipped package chips from a circuit board like this one. A couple of quick closing comments. First, I've used this technique to remove the chips on the left side of this board. These have been replaced with appropriate sockets. Uh, this one is 18 pin. This one, I believe, is 14, or is that a 16 pin? Yeah, that's probably 16. That one's 14, and that's the 8 pin. So these size chips work just fine. I haven't tried it with the other ones that you see over here. Uh, I didn't need to, but I think the technique would be suitable. Uh, it's just a matter of finding an appropriate tool to lever the chip out. Obviously, as they get bigger, it's going to get a little bit harder, and these tweezers that I've used are probably just not going to cut it. So you might need a proper removal tool or probably just use Adrian's technique and do it the right way. Bonus content time. Take a look at this socket I installed in the 555 timer's location. As you can tell, it's not a proper 8-pin socket. I just didn't have one available on hand to use at the time. The two pin socket is cut from another six pin socket that was unusable. In fact, you may have noticed that I employed this strategy for my 18 pin sockets. They're just six pin sockets aligned together. Now, if you find yourself in such a position where you don't have a particular size socket available, you can always combine smaller socket sizes to get the ultimate size you need.
Let's test out my Franken socket with the 555 timer chip and see if it fits. Looks like that fits fairly well. So that will wrap things up for this video and as always, thank you for watching and I hope you find this information useful. Please feel free to add your comments to the discussion below and to use the like and dislike buttons at your leisure. Don't forget to subscribe for more content and I hope to see you back soon.